and Salil Barik Bagari is our guest today on the podcast from Odell Technology, the founder and CEO of Quibble. Morning, Angle. Good morning, Stephen. It's very nice to see you again. Thank you for joining us today. I was wondering if you would tell the audience a little bit about your background and how you ended up where you where you are today, please. Yeah, thank you. Basically, my my background, you know, I, I studied electronics engineering and, and computer science. And, and then I did a PhD in, in biomedical engineering, especially in the area of uh, computer vision uh, applied to medicine. And I was always captivated by the capabilities of algorithms on quantifying findings in, in medical imaging data, like MRI, CT, uh, or PET images. Um, and that was the beginning of, of my career. No? I started to, to work with doctors, um, you know, who later became, for example, co-founders of my company. And, and we started very early in 2007, applying uh, computer vision algorithms to, to medical imaging data to try to make uh, medical image interpretation more objective, more reproducible. Okay, so can you tell me something about Quibim, please, and what it is? <clears throat> so Quibim is the, Quibim, actually, how we call it, is the consolidation of all that research activity we did around 2007 until you know today we keep doing all the research Kibim has a strong R&D area but we decided to consolidate all that knowledge in computer vision and AI applied to medical imaging data into a company that's basically the result of what we call quantitative imaging biomarkers in medicine QUIBIM that's that's Kibim and that means that we consider medical images as a biological sample, digital sample that we can measure. And those measurements are the called imaging biomarkers, right? I mean, we have biomarkers from blood, we have biomarkers from urine. Why don't we have imaging biomarkers? So parameters we can extract from those images. And basically what Kibim does is we have a business model based on AI that can streamline the extraction of these imaging biomarkers in an out automated way, right? So we, we do full automation. As soon as we get an MRI, a CT scan, we can extract data, um, you know, just in seconds for doctors. Okay, so the system does prostate, brain, liver, um, breast, lung. I think they're the, the subcategories. Let's talk about each category, if that's okay. So with the prostate, it's from a CT scan or from an MRI? Yeah, so we basically work with standard of care imaging data. Um, usually when we train the AI models, we need access. And for prostate, the standard of care for, you know, before the biopsy, that means when we need to detect cancer is a magnetic resonance imaging nowadays. Um, there, are, there are guidelines for how these images have to be acquired and how to, how to be interpreted uh, by the radiologists. And this is basically the PIRATS guidelines. Uh, these guidelines define the image acquisition protocols. So what is the pixel size, slice thickness? What are the physical parameters with which the images have to be acquired? And then also how to interpret. Once I have the T2 image, once I have the diffusion image, uh, if I see a dark region, if I see a bright region, there are some qualitative scoring that the radiologists must follow. And unfortunately, that is prone to a high variability across sites, right? And, and that's where we start to enter into the game, yeah. Okay, so this is true of the brain, the liver, the breast, the lung? Uh, yeah, it depends on the modality. For example, a, a brain is um, by default uh, an area that's mainly studied by MRI. In established disease, I mean, when you have like acute phases like a stroke i mean the, the standard of care is a ct scan in the emergency department but for established disease like alzheimer's disease dementia multiple sclerosis amyotrophic lateral sclerosis M mri is the standard of care and that's where we enter into the play as well okay all right but but you might have others like for example lung cancer that we are working on a new product right now Lung cancer is uh, de facto a technique for CT scan. I mean, when you have to study lung parenchyma, MRI is not a good modality because you don't see the lung tissue. 
you know, in a clear way because of the high heterogeneity of, of the magnetic susceptibility because of the oxygen, because of the cavities. And for that, the CT scan is, is the best technology nowadays. So we at Kevin work mainly with MRI, CT, or PET. These are the three modalities we touch, depending on the, on the indication, depending on the pathology. I saw uh, many years ago a company called Imbio, I-M-B-I-O. They were an MIT spin-out, and they worked yeah. They detected idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Yeah. They did a very good job of working with um, Roche and Boehringer Ingelheim um, with their modalities for uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Are you working with any pharmaceutical companies with your modalities? Yes, actually, that's a strong component of, of our business model nowadays. So we at Kibim combine basically uh, an intent research activity having access to a huge amount of data. And that is allowing us to extract insights from those research activities that we can take to products. And, and our products are medical devices that, that apply to a single individual. For example, today we have QP prostate and QP brain as clear devices, but we are doing research, not only in prostate and brain, but also in the new products we are gonna create. No? And we use collaborations with biopharma companies to identify new and met needs. And, and today we have active collaborations with Merck, with J&J, uh, &J, with Novartis, and with other top biopharma players that I still cannot disclose. But basically we work with them in all these indications, right? It's a kind of pan-cancer collaboration. Sometimes it's trying to predict response to immunotherapy using the baseline imaging data. Others is trying to reassess you know, a negative phase three trial they had and, and they say, okay, how can we better engineer this trial in the future, right? Maybe there is a group of patients that's not candidate to our drug. Can we, can we select which patients are the ideal ones to benefit from our drug so that we can get the drug approved for this group of patients? And then the other ones, maybe they go into another drug we are developing, right? So it's basically precision medicine, right? It's stratifying patients so that each group of patients can benefit from the best therapy using imaging. Absolutely. Okay. Um, in terms of reimbursement, we were very we were involved in the AI reimbursement through Medicaid in the USA recently. You're very much aware of the the, the recent changes to AI reimbursement. Are you working with those organizations in the USA? Yes. So right now we are starting on, on that landscaping analysis on, on what is the best reimbursement pathway for, for the U.S. I think everyone has in mind like getting a code, getting a code, you know, but but we see that that's just, you know, a relatively simple step. I mean, it, it's a step that must be undertaken. Yes. Uh, we, of course, are chasing uh, getting a CPT3 code for, for prostate cancer detection using AI. But we are very much aware that probably the heavy lifting sits more on the coverage and the payment, right? And, and that's basically yeah. negotiation um, one on one with uh, the insurance companies and the payers in general and, and leveraging all the community. Okay. Are you doing the same in Europe by any chance? Uh, in Europe, we have a, a different approach. I mean, we, we started with a software as a service business model uh, because, you know, in Europe, we have some countries with this universal healthcare approach that's more based on a, not looking at the PNL for a single patient, right? Yes. Um, um, so they are more thinking as a global healthcare system. And, and for them, I think this business model in which we charge them a subscription fee that has an, an annual price, an annual fee um, for having access to our algorithm, is 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 working quite well. I mean, since we deployed in in the UK, in sorry in in Europe, uh, the deployments are, are working out nicely. For the UK, right now we are engineering a, a different approach. Um, we we are starting to roll out the product in the country, and you know we we need to do basically a deep market analysis, also trying to be aligned with Nice and. And then tr trying to come up with a value proposition for the country yes. and demonstrating that having QP prostate before the biopsy is, you know, not only detecting more cancer and saving more patients, but also has, you know, a value, a return on investment uh, for the whole system, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
absolutely. I couldn't agree more. You you really do have to develop a good value proposition across Europe, hmm. particularly now. I think France is now reimbursing some AI, right? um, but that's that. But that's a separate story. So mm -hmm. if I if people want to make contact with you, how many sites do you have, or how many offices have you got currently? Yeah, we have uh, five uh, offices. So we have uh, Valencia is the headquarters, Madrid, Barcelona, and then we have Cambridge in the UK and New York. And these are the main hubs where we have the most of the employees. Then we will always have like, you know, for example, our chief medical officer, Dr. Glenn Weiss, he is in Boston by strategic reasons, right? Because most of the biotech atmosphere is, is there. Um, yeah, we also have employees in the Netherlands that, that, that depends on, on, on the locations. We, we have a policy in the company that's a work from anywhere, right? But with a very strong company culture. I mean, I, I am very much rooted in, in trying to define a, a clear culture of the company. One of my earlier investors, that's one of the best business angels in Spain, he, he's very much deep into culture. And, and, you know, I was irradiated that kind of relevance of, yes. you know, you have to define a culture from the very beginning because this is something very hard to build once the company is 100 employees or 200 employees. So you have to really build the culture when you are two or three people and then start growing it, right? And, uh, and that was a, a pretty meaningful advice because it's defined, you know, the success so far in managing the company and, and getting stickiness from the employees and the low turnover rate we have. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. I don't think many startups give that much consideration, but I think that's a very wise idea. Is there anything that you'd like to discuss in detail and talk to people about in great detail? Well, I think it is important to understand um, what is the difference between like the standard AI imaging market that is mainly focused in trying to optimize radiology's workflow, right? And trying to make them report faster, trying to make them report more. That's not really the focus of Kibim. We consider that as um, you know a secondary benefit. If we can optimize the way radiologists report in terms of time, but we want more to optimize the way radiologists report in terms of value they can extract from the imaging exam. So, for example, maybe if reading a CT scan right now, you know, of course, you are gonna spend less time with AI. That that's a no-brainer because we we are highlighting the brain volume, sorry, the lung yeah. volumes, the lesions, where they are. So they go faster for sure. But our main goal is how can we extract information from the images that the radiologist cannot guess with the naked eye? For example, looking at a CT scan, we want to be able to tell the oncologist which is the mutation of the lung cancer, right? So. That's that can only be done by AI. So we, we want to be able to extract a huge amount of value from the imaging data. And for example, we know that a tumor in an area in the end is the expression of the genotype. No, and we say, well, we can maybe analyze those pixels and try to guess the mutation that that tumor has. So we can be a complement for molecular biology. So it, that's why we are basically selecting these motto of transforming imaging data into actionable predictions. That's, yes. I think, the big difference towards being a one-trick pony company with one single application and just trying to improve workflow. That's okay. But we see that long-term, that's a low value. If we want to really have high value and be useful for doctors and patients, we need first to make radiologists to have kind of superpowers. No? And, and for that, we envisage radiologists going to a tumor board and saying, you know, according to the CT scan, this is the mutation this patient has, or this is the overall survival this patient has and uh, expected, right? And that's something they cannot see with the naked eye nowadays. Okay, absolutely. So you're trying, trying to create actionable data for the patient pathway. Yes, exactly. Okay, perfect. I think that now the changes that have recently happened in NICE and the new changes that are coming in 2025, patient reported outcomes are going to be extremely yeah. important, as yeah. you probably know. Are you creating a registry or of any kind in any country um, regarding your technology? 
Yes, so we we have basically from the very early days uh, we we have participated in the biggest research initiatives in the European Union. Uh, yes. The European Commission has released many Horizon Europe projects on on data registries. So, yes. for example, the biggest pediatric cancer project uh, was on neuroblastoma and the IPG was sitting on our platform, which is the main backbone yes. platform. That's Cupid Insights. That's basically the software we deploy for managing like huge amount of data, like large data sets. It's the same that we deploy to a biopharma company, by the way. You know, we we deploy Cupid Insights. They can organize all the imaging data plus clinical data, plus molecular biology. And then, you know, automatically the AI models that are there, they can combine the images into the, into features and link with other clinical and, and genomic variables, right? So that was the basis for, for the pediatric cancer study. Then it became also the basis for Shimelion repository. That's a yes. prostate, lung, colorectal, and breast. Um, and then right now, there's a new uh, European initiative that's targeting to have more than 100,000 cancer patients for the year 2027. That's called EUCAIM, that is European yeah. Cancer Images. And also the backbone platform is, is going to be keeping sites on, on that. No? So that's how we have basically secured that pillar on, on the data access that's allowing us to learn on data heterogeneity and how to harmonize, how, how harmonize, how to deal with large uh, data sets from multi data. Sets. Okay, that's and, great. And we want to apply like the same philosophy to to other regions and other countries, no? But yeah, so far we are having access to these uh, large data sets. Yeah. Oh, fantastic! Are you working with any of the autonomous regions in Spain? Yes, uh, we we actually have. Um, you know, have been deploying our solution in in Andalusia, for example, in the south, um, with a tender for QP prostate that, that we won, uh, Valencia region as well, in Catalonia, Madrid. Um, so these are the most relevant regions so far. Right now we are in negotiations for Galicia in the northwest, northwest of, of the country. And, and we are trying to go step by step because, of course, AI adoption is not insane on an overnight, no? And and we need to we need to prove our value, and that's what we are doing. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very much for your time today. It's been Thank a you. Pleasure talking to you, and I wish you all the very best. Thank you.